It's the radio guy, Mike Prince, and we have a special edition. We figured since it was coming up on the Celebration Bowl 2019, we might as well connect the dots with someone who last brought a championship to Prairie View a m University on the football side of things, and that's none other than Coach Henry Frazier. How you doing today, Coach? Oh, Mike, I'm doing well, man. I appreciate you having me. I love to talk about football. Hey, you know what? I'm glad that you have uh, made yourself available and some football we shall talk. But before we get into that, man, why don't you bring us up to speed about what's been up in the world of Coach Henry Frazier? Oh, wow. There's been a lot going on. Um, I say in the past three years, you know, I've still been helping out as an assistant football coach at Bowie State. And, um, We've been remarkable. We've made three playoff appearances, um, back-to-back conference championships. I'm a special assistant to the head coach, as well as the assistant offensive line coach, and and I, you know, just being close to the game. And I'm also working with ESPN three, you know, color analyst game. So when the when schedule permits, and when I'm not, you know, it's a home game or the night game, we have schools in the area like Howard, Morgan State. Uh, Georgetown, Towson University. So I'll go out and um, do some color analysts for ESPN. And, and I do a lot of the Howard games, especially if the time permits. So staying close, and I'm still uh, the high school athletic director at Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. is actually the oldest high school in the country. for It's the first high school in the country for African Americans, uh, the Dunbar High School in D.C. So uh, I got so busy at I did that for three, for four years. Then I just this year I decided to just focus on football and the color analyst and doing some teaching, some um, teaching some classes and things. You know, I got my doctorate from Prairie View um, a few years ago, so I am an alum of Prairie View. I love that school, and um, so that's what I've been doing. Been pretty busy. I'm, um, you know, my kids are in college now. They, you know, they were little babies in elementary school when I was at Prairie View. So uh, my, my son is a freshman at James Madison, and my daughter's a sophomore at Fallsburg State up here in Maryland, and James Madison is in Virginia. So, you know, kind of, you know, got them off to college, and um, they, they got me beautiful lady. I'm going to marry uh, in June. So, you know, life is good for Coach Frazier. Well, it sounds like it, man. And I don't know uh, if it's too late if you're giving out all the invitations. At least, you know, <laughs> send one my way, man, so I can at least feel a little better about myself. How about that, man? Hey, look here. Hey, look here. You don't have to get your passport. That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> we, we, we going out the country and do it, you know. So we both want to, you know, see, hey, we were married before in the United States. Let's go get married outside the country. And I do understand. Invite our friends and family. Just have a good old party. I do understand. Understand. I do understand. Well, your son, a freshman at James Madison, which kind of falls into what we we're going to be talking about, some college football, in particular on the FCS level. James Madison on a collision course to meet with North Dakota State uh, in a couple of weeks, if all things hold up this coming weekend. Yeah, we talk about it a lot because uh, he was like, Dad, it's a crazy atmosphere. Some days, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll go out tailgate and, and go to the games and he you know, he actually took the bus trip up to their first game, which they lost. I think it was either West Virginia or Pittsburgh or something. They played one of those schools, and they took the bus up. He was on the bus as a freshman and uh, went to the game, and he, he's enjoying his college life. But uh, James Madison is the real deal, and um, you're right. They're on a collision course. I'm, I think everyone is looking forward to, to them meeting. Those would truly be the two top teams in FCS football. Well, I, I would ask you who you think would win, but you might have some partiality toward James Madison, man, since your son's connected there. But it should yeah. be a good game. I'm, so I'm not going to put you on the spot with that one, all well, right? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be always be fair, but I, w- I would give James Madison a nod because it'll be outside. You know, they won't be in that dome, that Fargo dome, so they'll have them outside. You know, James Madison likes to bring those elements. It'll be cold up in those 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 mountains up there where James Madison is. So you know, even though you never know what the weather can be for the championship game, but you know, you look at North Dakota State, they're they're a powerful program, but they're a little different outside than they are in that Fargo Dome. Oh yeah, I know. And you know, um I had never seen an FCS program that played ten home games. That's ridiculous, <laughs> man. That that there there should be some rule against that, isn't it? Well, you, you get your conference games um, split up, and then, you know, you just buy those other games. You know you're going to sell it out. You can pay people to come on in there, and um, that's 
two home field advantages. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. But they've been consistent, they and James Madison, but they got to get past these semifinals this weekend, and we'll see how things come. But meanwhile, as my father used to say, on the other side of the ranch, there's a huge FCS game coming up in Atlanta, Georgia, between the North Carolina A&T Aggies and the Alcorn State Braves. They're, they're meeting again. North Carolina A&T just seems to have the swag these days, no matter what's going on, they appear to be the last man standing each year from the MEAC. Yeah, they, they have they have the formula. They have the formula that was implemented by old Coach Ron Broadway in terms of having hey, a strong running game, a scout defense. We're going to limit our mistakes, and then you don't have to beat us. We're not going to beat ourselves. And it seems that that has carried over the last couple of years with Coach Washington. Yes, sir. Now, with that being said, Coach, and you've had it, you've uh, inherited a program or two that was struggling. And realistically, how long does it take for you to get your blueprints on your program the way you want it to go? I always say that year three. It depends on how bad the program was when you take it over. But year three, you should start seeing significant improvements if you have the right plan in place the right plan in place and and so three years is about that good gauge so is it safe to assume that if you're on either side of the fence with you on the coaching staff side or the administrative side after year three if it has not parlayed to what you think it should have been is it then from your opinion that the handwriting is on the wall, that maybe it's time to go another direction or do some it, drastic changes. It's, it's, you definitely want to stop thinking that way, but sometimes there are, you know, extenuated circumstances, you know, you have to be a, really a student of the game, depending on what sport we're talking about, because I remember year three at, 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 at Prairie View, we, even though we didn't have a winning season, I think we lost like four or five games by – three or four points or less, you know, something like that. So we lost our kicker. He ended up only passing 23 credits, and he was one credit short. So we had our All-American punter start kicking, and he got hurt. So our kicking game just just went horrible. But we we had other things in place. Had we had that kicking game, we would have really – we would have won, had a winning season in year three. So I ended up signing two kickers, a punter, and a long tap. <laughs> that, that last all three. I said, this will never happen to me again. So, you know, when you look at things like that, you know, Charles and I sat down, even though it was year three, but you can still see we had a quarterback, we had a running back, you know, we had receivers, our whole line, D-line was, was pretty good. We wasn't getting beat up and down. We were in every game pretty much, with the exception of maybe one game or two. So we were ready to roll, but special teams are such a huge part of the game that we didn't. I mean, we had the guy who broke the freshman record. He was all conference as a kicker. So we didn't have no – I didn't think to go sign another kicker. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, get, the kid would have been back, but he he taught me a valuable lesson. And <laughs> I, I I never was in that situation again. So if you would have gave me for year three because of the record, oh, man, you never know what could have ended up happening. We would have maybe never won the championship. Y'all would have ran me out of town. So, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes there are extenuating circumstances that, you know, you as the – the, uh, I guess the observer needs to take it to consideration. Okay, okay. That's, a, a, as I say, a note, as I say, duly noted on that. With that being said, uh, you got year three, you get over some humps, you have some, some uh, unusual circumstances that happen, and you start putting things together. What is the message that you're saying publicly and privately? And when I say that, you know, you when it's rough, it seems like the media is the big bad villain. But when it's smooth, they can be your best ally. So, what's your public and private message to you internally, and then publicly to your team, and then the media? Well, uh, you know, my recommendation: you can't panic. You know, hopefully, your message is the same thing it was day one. You know, because if you start changing every time somebody gets mad at you or every time something bad happens or every time something good happens, then, you know, it's sort of like building your house on some clay. You know, you know, it's just going to just blow away when the storms come because the storms are going to come. So if you're secure and you say, this is how we're going to do it, this is, you know, you know, this is why we're doing it this way, 
and you're securing that everybody around you are, your message should not change. You know, and, I, and a lot of times I see young coaches panic. You know, I, they'll be like, okay, this isn't working. Unless, you know, and then, the, the tale is when you start seeing uh, they're changing coordinators, you know, in year two, year three, you know, going to your final year of your contract. There's one, two reasons that happens. Either you, you don't panic as the head coach or everybody jumping off the ship. So they see it sinking. But, you know, I think consistency is the key to any successful uh, program. And that's really whatever sport we're talking about. You know, when I had a chance to be the athletic director up here, I pretty much, we hired our softball coach. She won the championship. My girls basketball coach I hired, she won the championship in year two or year three. My football coach, he just won the championship. This was year three for him. And mind you, the football program had made the playoffs in four years, and that's not that's unheard of for Dunbar High School in D.C. He is the, actually the D.C. coach of the year. And then baseball hadn't won any game. They had brought the program, we brought the program back, and they made the playoffs last year. So he was just in year two as the head coach. So you start looking at, you know, when you start hiring people and, and bringing them, man, it, it, it's, a, it's actually a pretty awesome. Man. And then tennis. I actually was a tennis coach because I brought tennis to Dunbar, and I had a girl who was second in the city. And, and tennis, just spending time with her, I don't know much about tennis, you know, <laughs> but I know. I know about coaching. I know about, you know, encouraging. I know about discipline and things along those lines. So, yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 it is a method to it. But, you you know, you have to be consistent with your method. You, you, you can't be wishy-washy. Absolutely, which uh, leads us to uh, National Signing Day. It's a big hype. Um, everybody's excited. And to be perfectly honest with you, in my opinion, from outside looking in, sometimes it's about show and tell. Guys get a bunch of names on the list, and they highlight, you know, and have their huddle film all over. And then a semester, a year, two years later, these guys are nowhere to be found. That is more, I think, of the showmanship when it comes to college athletes. And to be honest with you, is it as hyped up as it should be? Oh, no question about it, man. I'm going to tell you, signing day is, is the lifeline of every program. When we would come in and our suits, we were suited and booted on signing day. It was a, it's a big day. You think about some of these coaches spend years cultivating relationships with these young men or young women, depending on the sport. And you spend, you're, you're recruiting them. You're, you're trying to get them to your school. And then to get them to sign that letter, it is, it is a celebration. Now, you know, one of the things I always say, you have to know your program, know what type of program you want, what type of kid you want in your program. Just don't sign, oh, he's a four-star, he's a three-star, you know. But then if you already got a committed person at that position, you know, or, or you overload in one position and you don't really focus on, you know, what your needs are, you're just going after just to sign people. That's when you start seeing people disappearing in a year or two. Man, you signed me to come here. You already got three three quarterbacks. Well, you know, I'm never going to play here. But you signed him because he was so good. He might can't beat out your people who already know the plays and, and the kids are beat. They're impatient now. So, you know, they'll just leave. Right. You know, transfer portal. You know, oh, man, I'm out of here. I'm not going to beat this guy. Or oh, they don't want to put the work in. They don't want to learn to play. They don't want to learn the system. They don't want to be on the scout team. They don't want to pay their dues. Everybody coming out of high school is a star. You know, and, you know, but a lot of it is understand that exactly what your needs are. And then you going after you signing those instead of just signing whoever you can get your hands on. Right. And see, it's also, it's, to me, it's a twofold message. I, my pop used to always instruct me. He said, son, you're good. He said, but always remember, there's someone out there who's going to be a little bit better than you. So you mm-hmm. have to be ready to to compete and fight for that right to be on that team. And what's happening, at least from my vantage point, guys get a little bit of competition and they don't want that. And so they, they choose to exit out toward the portal. Then it creates a huge domino effect on that said program because now 
you have APR involved. Kids leave schools, go to another school, and they're just hopping like they're transferring tickets on a, a city bus route. And it, it's not that easy for the said institution. And these kids are leaving residue tracks that's not too productive. And then you have kids that are coming from FBS programs who might have had some challenges, whether they're moral or immoral challenges. That's something that you have to determine and look at, too, as keeping a program afloat and moving in the right direction as well. No question about it. I mean, there's so many different entities and so many different <laughs> angles that you can talk about it when you start dealing with a transfer. Because when, when a young man transfer or decides or a student athlete decides they want to transfer, it's for a reason. And now you, as the institution that's bringing that person in, you have to decide, do you want that problem? Because there's always a reason why kids leave. And most of the time, it's because they don't think they're going to play at that place. So if you've got a kid, you know, that don't think he's going to play, you have to be up front with them and say, we got players here. I never promised a kid a starting job. I never said you're going to play. And I, I like to think we're going to recruit players where you're going to have to compete. And if, and if you don't have it in you to compete, I really don't want you anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know I understand about the APR, and you, but you just have to hire or have good compliance people in place where you track those people when they leave. Because I'm always saying, if you don't want to be here, let me help you go where you want to go. And then that way I can keep tabs on you so when you graduate, we get the point back. I'm not going to just let you. If I recruit a kid, I care about the kid. And they all know that. They say, I'm not just not recruiting you to play football. I'm recruiting you so I care about you and I care about your development. So even if you decide you want to leave, which we really didn't have a lot of kids leaving. We had kids wanting to stay. You know, and wherever I coach, they wanted to stay because you want to create and build that, that culture. So then that means you have to be careful on who you allow in your house. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to bring a kid in and you understand they got this baggage and that baggage, and say, okay, you know what? I can't bring but so many rough guys in because we got to keep an eye on these guys. You wanna, <laughs> you're going to have a couple. You right, know, you want to have right. a few that's going to go after it. You know, they may be a little on the edge, but you know what? You know, now we got coaches watching them. I can't have too many where we want one out of coaches to keep eyes on these guys. <laughs> and then once they realize, you know, this is the culture, this is, you know, these are some guys trying to get degrees, just playing ball, trying to win some championships, they fall in line. They right. fall in line because if you all, you can't just build a team on transfers because there's no foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So I can't give away all my secrets. I may be coaching again. One oh, okay. I'm not. I'm not. We're talking right now with Coach Henry Frazier, um, a PV graduate. Got his doctorals from PV. As a matter of fact, in the 10 year anniversary of Prairie View winning the Southwest Athletic Conference Championship over Alabama A and M Bulldogs. So, congratulations on year 10 of the celebration, too, Coach. Oh, wow. I appreciate it. It is 10 years. Wow. (laughs) Yes, sir. It it is absolutely awesome. Which leads us now to the Celebration Bowl. Of course, it was not in place uh, when you uh, were coaching. And matter of fact, it was the Heritage Bowl had kind of just died out. And this was on the brink of coming some years down the road. But now you have this Celebration Bowl. You have all corn who has been on a phenomenal run, six consecutive Eastern Division uh, titles from the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and then the phenomenal run from uh, uh, North Carolina A&T. What are you seeing as a football coach that these two teams are bringing to the table? It's definitely going to be a nice physical football game. Like, I mean, every time they get together, it seems like it's going to be close. Um you know, I just look at a and T's and that that defense. You know, they have number one defense. They got the rushing attack, you know, with Jermaine Martin and um you know, they, and then look at Alcorn, who kinda got away with one against Southern in my opinion. I think Southern kinda gave that away. I think Southern had an opportunity to win that championship. But Phyllis Harper is so dynamic to me. He he really is the he's gonna be that common he has to have an out just a superb game. Because all corn defense is not as good as it's been in the past. It's still pretty good. And um, they're kind of in the middle of the road as it relates to total defense and then the running game. They don't, you know, he, he completes some third down passes. 
and, and they protect that football, he, he's going to keep Alcorn in the game. They, and, and Alcorn got one of those, like, no superstar on defense. It's a, a team defensive effort. So, you know, it's going, but I think a lot of it for Alcorn will fall on Felix, on Felix Hopper. And, um, but with A&T, they got a, just, a, just a suffocating defense and a rushing game. And, and they got a kid, uh, Roberts over there, Jacob Roberts, who just sack and get after the, the quarterback, tackles for loss and things like that. So, you know, there's it, a few, few, few little superstars on that a and side, but they're also on one of those teams that just got a lot of real good football players, and they play real good team defense. So I'm excited to watch it. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to give you four categories, Coach, and I want you to uh, decide, you know, from your observations, who you give the advantage to. Okay, offense. Okay. Offense, I'm gonna go with A and T. Defense, A and T. Special teams. Yeah, that's kind of in the middle of the road for me. Uh, we'll, we'll just give it all call just for the sake of the argument. Okay, and coaching. <laughs> we'll give it that to all call. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, I don't want to put words in your mouth. A and T has the better offense and defense, which theoretically would give them a slight advantage coming into this game. But because of the special teams and coaching, gives all corner fighters chance. Yeah, that, that sounds good. I, I, I'll go with that one. That, that's, that's a good amount. That's a you know because I I just think that Felix Hopper kid is going to be the X factor. I think if he has just a dynamic game, it's going to, it can be special. But if he if he's not great, Ant is going to go and run away with it. Because if they push put him in a situation where he has to throw the ball to beat him, that's when it's going to get ugly for Alcorn. Okay, okay, that's where it's going to get ugly. Well, I got you on record now, Coach. So we'll have to come back <laughs> and, and revisit this one here. My concern has been. I think the styles of play that each conference brings and the way that the current situation is set up, the rest that comes from um, the MEAC champion compared to that of the SWAC champion gives a slight advantage to the MEAC, but it is what it is. Do you see a big difference in the styles of play from each conference? Yeah, I actually do. Um, and, and I think I, I think the SWAC, the MEAC is a more of a traditional style. When we transition from the SWAC to the MEAC, the MEAC is more traditional style. Your four three base defense, your um, you know tight end may play in the game a little bit, and uh, you may see a fullback here and there. Real, you know, it's more physical brand where the SWAC has been more finesse and. You know, but and the thing that that always used to balance it out was the speed of the swag defenders, like those linebackers, those big old defensive ends coming off the edge and things like that. So I think the swag now is starting to, to play a, a different brand of defense than it used to be. Because you know, you, you had those 30, 30 front or three man front, you had those all uh, the four two five. So you had to be more finesse because of the offenses of the swag. And then when they go line up against the defense, I mean, the offense of the me, I, you know, it's almost they getting punched in the mouth because they're not used to putting four linemen down, you know, bringing somebody extra safety down in the box. They're not used to playing that because they don't see it a lot in the conference. So when they have to play that type of, of, of football, that's what, to me, that's what gives the me an advantage over because if you're not as physical, and I know you're not, I'm not changing. <laughs> I'm going to keep on hitting you in your mouth. Uh-huh. And, and, uh-huh. You know, and then that does spill over to the office because, man, you're pressing because you're not going to get as many possessions because, you know, they run the ball, hitting you in the mouth, running the ball. Next, you know, I only got the ball four times in the whole first first half. Okay, so now I got to I gotta try to score because they get it back. I mean, I get it. It, it changes philosophies and things like that. Well, let me and ask you. To me, that's the difference. Let me ask you this, Coach. If if you are in a conference, and let's just say we're talking about the SWAC right now, and I think part of the challenge is when we're recruiting, game planning, or whatever you want to talk about, assessing your team, 
I think we are stuck in thinking about swag and not thinking beyond swag, i.e. Celebration Bowl. And if you happen to get a chance for the FCS playoffs, could you not recruit two type of interior linemen on the defensive side is what I'm thinking now, because you got some guys that you can use as plugs. And then you have some guys that can use as that speed rusher type. Isn't it best to have that kind of mixed quality of depth on your defensive interior line? Yeah, it, it, it definitely will, will be proven. I think to have, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, I look at the philosophy of your defense because we didn't have the one play over 300 pounds on defense. I don't believe in big old defense. A guy I like fast, strong defenders. And it's gap control defense. So my thing is, I don't care how big you are. If you got a gap to protect, protect the gap. So if I see what you're doing on offense, you want to run the ball, you want to come down here, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's incumbent upon those those defensive line, those three techniques, them five techniques, them the Zero techniques, those guys are to protect their guy. Okay, I'll dig you out. You know, you, you may have a few plugs that you say, okay, we're going to go in there. But normally when those guys are that big, they don't get a lot of reps. Man, they, they're not very good. So, I understand that. But I'm talking about yeah. uh, as far as the latter part, the second half. I, I've seen teams fade in that second half because they have that fast, uh, strong guy. But you you let 320 pounds go up against 250 pounds for 60 minutes. That 350 is going to wear that 250 out sooner or later. Yeah, and, and again, it goes to having 12 defensive linemen on your roster, 15 to 16 offensive linemen on your roster. And that's all I always kept. That's one – I'm giving away my secrets again, but you build <laughs> your team – with your offensive and defensive line. Because you have to build a team that's going to be able to sustain. So if I'm rotating, if I'm playing eight, we should take 10 defensive line on the, on the road trips. They're playing. All 10 of them playing. We're rotating them in. So therefore, I'm not, you're not going to lay on my same 275 pound high technique all day. I'm just not going to let you do that. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep rotating them in. We're going to keep rotating them in. We're going to keep fresh bodies in front of you. And of course, with injuries and things like that happen, that's just a part of the game. But given the perfect world, and I had my my guys about things. That's what we're gonna have. We're gonna have ten defensive linemen in in the game. You know, two of them may just be you know special teams guys, but eight of them gonna play every game. Well, how do you counter coach the this this high speed offensive attack where you don't have time to rotate your guys? Yeah, they just gotta be in shape. That's why I ain't have but one defensive line play over three hundred pounds. <laughs> but they both. Well, you know, so we we were ready to roll with. Come on, keep going. You know, and then you know you get a play, then you know, hey, then the next possession you got four new guys out there. Okay, so you, like you said, you may not be able to get. You might have to go seven, eight plays. But again, you should be practicing out there. Practice. You should be you should be having your your ten rep sessions with no break, ten plays. I want this ball snapped before twenty five seconds on the clock. Because if you scouted that team, you know what they're gonna do. So, therefore, your scout team should be replicating it as best they can in practice. I'm not, hopefully, I don't get too many surprises on the field. Right. Hopefully, I, I, we've prepared ourselves. If, we, if they snapping it before 25 seconds, trust me on this one, Mike. They're not running nothing too complicated because you're not doing no motion. You're not doing no trade. you just lining up, snapping the ball fast. As a defense, I'm going to figure that out pretty quick. Right, you right. Know? Because if you're snapping the ball with 15 seconds after the play is over, with, you already got your play designed. And you don't really care what defense I'm in. You're going to run your play. And I used to always say something. Heist taught me this. Heist knows it. He's always say, you know, defense call plays too. Hmm. You know, so, so you, just because the offense called the play, okay, you called the play, I called the play too. So therefore, and that, that was really profound on me because it was like a lot of people don't think defense, they think they just line up and, and react to the offense. Uh-huh. Man, if you're a good defense, the offense is going to start reacting to you. Right. So you, you keep lining up and going fast if you want to. <laughs> and we we, we, still, we mess around the call that right blitz coming off that edge. And we done caused a turnover because you ain't had time to even see where we're lined up. Right. So I'm not going to let you dictate to me. 
eventually I'm gonna say, hold on, you're not gonna just keep hitting me. I'm I'm, I'm gonna swing back. <laughs> eventually I'm so, gonna get one in every now and then, right? And, and that's the that's the beauty of football. That's why I love it so much because it, it is a chess match. It is a chess match because now you have to become and get tendencies. Okay, second down, right hash inside the forty. They ran this play thirty six percent of the time. So now we get in this situation. I'm calling this play. I don't care as a defense. I'm calling this play because I know the chances are they get ready to run this outside zone to the field. I'm, I'm sending the cornerback off the edge. I'm gonna leave one on one coverage with the safety. Got to get over top to get to that number one receiver. Man, if they fake it and throw it, they gonna beat. But if not, they gonna have a big loss. So you start thinking things like that based on field position, hash marks, what they've done in the past. Because you're going to have every play they ran the whole season. Right. So you as a coach, that's, that's doing your homework. That's putting your players in positions to be successful. And that's what we always done. I'm, we would coach against each other. I mean, we would scout each other because I'm never going to – I don't want to go into a game unprepared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I mean, I'm getting excited thinking about it. Hey, hey, you know? I'm getting excited <laughs> listening to you, so it's all, it's all good. We're talking right now with Coach Henry Frazier. And, uh, Coach, I'm I'm ask you this because it's always going to come down to the Jimmys and the Joes. You know, you could have the best scheme known to man. And uh, we, we always say that, you know, talent, talent, talent. But then there's the old saying, hard work beats talent when talent don't work hard. Is it safe to assume that in the world of of recruiting and coaching that you might not get the four or five star players, as you mentioned earlier, but you can create a heck of a team with some two and three and even one star players? Uh, On our level, FCS level, that's what you better do. See, the thing about it, and I think uh, I'm going to get back to that. To answer your question is definitely yes. Definitely, yes. When I look at some of the players that we had that made it to the NFL, man, it wasn't on nobody recruiting radars, you know, and, and they just worked their behinds on. And a lot of them were defensive linemen coached by Big Miles Brandon. Yeah, I think he's one of the best defensive line coaches ever. He he never takes excuses. He he pushed those guys to work, 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 work. And that was like all of our coaches. So it becomes, you know, just it just becomes contagious because now I don't want him to outwork me. So then you got the receivers that don't actually work on the old line. Oh, man, you you know, it, it just becomes so infectious amongst your team. Right? All the coaches are trying to outwork the coaches. I want to prepare my players just as good as he prepared his players. And, and that makes you have an awesome team. And, and I think um, Billy Joe, Coach Joe, used to be at FAMU, said this. And it, and it is so true because I've been actually looking at it. When you look at the black colleges and you look at the white schools or the FCS level, and now you look at all the black players that's getting signed by all your FBS schools. And I looked at the University of Maryland before we started this conference. I'm looking at the people in Maryland signed 23 players today. 22 are black. That's unheard of. Uh, uh, uh. And, and, and the thing about it is, now where do all the great black players go? They're going up there. So the great white players, because they're still great white players, they go on to these the Montanas and the South Dakota States, and you know these are the guys that we were they were winning high. From. They can no longer compete when you got four black quarterbacks in the Pro Bowl. Come on, man! So you start looking at you start looking at the way this game is going. The, the white football players still playing football at a high level. They just ain't as good as or aren't as good as. The black players is going to these FCS schools. So where do they go? They still getting scholarships. They go to the Austin Peays and, and the Sam Houston's, and they're still really good football players. So when you start looking at your second tier to third tier black athletes going to the black schools, hey, man, you then you man, you basically if, if the black players were still going to, they wouldn't even be. Division three, they wouldn't even be scout team guys. But now they're starters at some of our HBCUs. So they're going against potential All-Americans 15, 20, 30 years ago. Right. So when you start weighing it like that, and it's something to think about. It's just some food for thought, that's all. And I, and I agree with Coach Joe when he said that. You know, I'm like, wow, you know, that that, that is true. So then, look at all these people they signed, all these schools they signed today. 
Right, right. So with that being said, what's the message that we give to the millennial African-American athlete about coming home or staying home? The question I'm going to ask is where is home? Home has changed. Because you may have said that to Emmett Smith 25 years ago, but where is home? He said it's from the staff. You know what I mean? So you start looking at your second, third generations removed from 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 segregation now. Right. So I'm looking at all of these great NBA players whose dad played in the league. The Hardaways and the, the Currys and you know, they they dad made a way for them in the in, a, in the NBA. They was their dads are NBA stars. So what if you look at what LeBron is doing with his son? They they're training these guys to be second and third generation professional athletes. So, you know, what do you tell when you say, where is home? That's my question. Where is home? Mm. You know, because when they get in trouble or something bad happens, they're looking to come back or come to the HBCUs. So we have to still keep that cultivating mindset. We're not going to get them initially. Okay. But if we keep the mindset that I'm still in the business of training young men to be great men, great fathers, great providers, if you're in that mindset, so when you get them stars, they got to get in where they fit in. This is how we do things. Or when you get the kid that's not as good, I don't care if you're not good now. We're going to go to the weight room three times a week. We're going to eat this way. We're not going to drink. We're going to practice this way. We're going to do this this way. Guess what? In three years, he's going to be really good. That's right. That's but right. If he's not good now, and you don't, and you turn your back on him, and you're not in the business of developing men, specifically if you are the HBCU black men, you don't have no business being there. In my opinion, it's just my opinion. Right. Because I, I knew I wasn't going to get the four or five star kids or whatever. Okay, that's fine. But the ones I got wanted to be there, so it was my obligation as a man to make sure they become better men when they left me. That's when I told their moms and their dads when I sat in the living rooms. When they come and spend four to five years with me, they're going to be a better man. They're going to have a degree. And, and Mike, I'm going to tell you something. We did a survey last year. I have 60, it was 65 kids that I coached that are coaching now. Mm. 65. That's a nice tree, man. You know? Yeah, and they, they, whether it's Pop Warner coaching their sons, whether it's college, it doesn't matter. They play for me. That are in the, and so that tells me that I was doing something right along the way in terms of, and I want to, because that's why I wanted to be a coach because of my high school coach. He was right. like a dad to me. Right. My dad died in second grade, last day of school. I'll never forget it. Mm. And the closest thing to a dad I had since then was my high school football coach. And, and I watched everything that man did. And I watched how, how he went about motivating us, how he demanded of us. And he, to me, he was one of the greatest men I've ever known in my life. His name Ralph Payton, P A D E M. And he is the, the one of the greatest men that I've ever met in my life. And I patterned pretty much everything, philosophies, everything after this man. He had the same coaching staff for 37 years wow. when he retired coaching. Wow. Yeah, a Hall of Fame up here in the state of Maryland. And, but, but he taught me about loyalty. And that's why we kept the same staff all the years at Prairie View. Like, I'm not in that fire, people. I'm in the people just being, you know, I like to create that family atmosphere, but if, they say, if I had to let you go, I'm going to let you go because I'm going to do what's best for the program. Right. The program will always supersede whatever relationship that may be in place. And I think that's the thing that our HBCUs are getting away from. And I'm going to step out and say some other stuff about our HBCUs because I got three degrees from HBCUs, so I feel like I, I can say these things and and this is a future research that I'm working on. I shouldn't talk about it now until I finish it. But I'll just mention a little bit about it. We need to start looking at our leadership. Yeah, and I'm not, they are, okay, and I'll say this. We, it's okay to pay money and go to HBCU, but are we going to bring back graduates to lead our HBCU? We're so quick to go, I'm going to go to to this school to a predominantly white institution to get a leader for, for the, our HBCU. And I know this from personal experience. When you go into a new situation, you want to surround yourself with the people you know. You want to surround yourself with people that you trust. 
So if you continually get your leaders from the white schools, they're going to bring in people they trust. And if you're not in their network as an HBCU graduate, guess what happens to all our graduates? Hmm. We're not good enough to even come back to our school and work and right. leave the place that we love. And eventually, our degrees are not going to mean anything if you're in education because you're not going to let me come back to my school because I want to go get somebody from Texas A&M or, you know, or somebody from the University of Houston because, you know, hey, do we really like ourselves? So that goes back to when you asked me where, and I said, where's home? Do we right, like ourselves? Right, right, right. Do we always got to go find someone? Because there got to be people that's, that's graduates that can lead our schools. Well, let me ask this question. Let me ask, maybe they don't want to lead the schools and the ones that are applying. And I'm just playing devil's advocate now, or mm-hmm. not qualified enough to lead the schools. Could that be the case? No, qualification is not the case. Because and no one's going to tell me that there aren't qualified individuals to lead whatever departments we're talking about. And I'm not, not, not just talking about presidencies or athletic directors or head football coaches or head basketball. I'm not just talking about, though. I'm talking about deans. I'm talking about, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, student affairs. I'm talking about all of those type of things because there are qualified people that can do it. And guess what? If you really want someone, you will pay them their worth. I got you. Think you. That dynamic. That's the bottom line because a lot of people run from education because of the quote unquote uh, pay. You know, they're like, I know I'd rather go out here in corporate America and make my money. Than- and, and, and I understand that. And that's, that's, that's per- perfectly fine. But I'm not, if you're a school that produces teachers, I'm not buying that there aren't any teachers that can. I was an education major. I went and got my master in school administration supervision and my doctorate in educational leadership. I stayed the course even though I was coaching. So, what I'm saying is there are thousands and thousands of other Henry Frazier's that have done the same thing. They may be doing something else, but they have the skill set and the education to go back in the education arena. Absolutely. And I, I agree with that uh, 1,000%. Um, I've been involved with education uh, for at some form, whether it's administrative level or a board of trustee level now for over 20 years. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. My wife uh, just got her master's in uh, education administration. So mm-hmm. we we are embedded into that world of investing back into our, our quote unquote kiddos in the community. Uh, we're talking right now with Coach Henry Frazier. And uh, we, we've been, as they say, having a wealth of conversation, uh, talking about athletics, talking about uh, education. And you made a comment, Coach, that I want to go back to real quick when it came to the FBS player that he won't come to us, but eventually will come back to us on the rebound. Do you think that's fair to the HBCU institution to receive that kid who may have turned their nose up for whatever reason and then has to come back to the HBCU institution on the rebound? Oh, oh most definitely it's fair. And, and the reason it being is because if a kid, and this is what I should tell the kids, if, if you could, even when I was at Purdue, I said, if you go to Texas A&M, they offer you a scholarship or University of Houston offer you a scholarship, you take it. Because I know you had aspirations of playing professional ball. But when your little heart get broken, <laughs> if something don't go right, you come on home, and we'll be right here waiting on you. And because you, you can't compete with that. You can't compete with what they have. No HBC you can keep compete with what the FBS has. None of them, in terms of the, in terms of the what the glitter, the lights, and the kids want the 18, 17, 18 year old see. Right. Don't even fool yourself in trying to. And, and it's ironic and then, that you say that. It's ironic that you say that because subconsciously we are trying to compete with them when we can't, you have to accept, it goes back to that question. Who are we? Where is home? You have to accept who you are and more importantly, whose you are. You'll catch that one later and, Mm -hmm. and, and, and begin to work with what you have to get to where you need. There are certain things that we're trying to reach for that are beyond reachable 
uh, aspirations because the target is going to always be moving. Soon as you get caught up to a certain level, oh, we got a new mandate out now and we're going to now <laughs> require this. So it will never be an even playing field. So why do we always chase the rabbit? Yeah, you know, you sound like John Thompson. You know, him and Louis Conner II used to wear those sweaters back in the day. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aging myself here, but <laughs> he, that's what that's what basically what John Thompson was talking about. He was talking about the black athlete, even though he was at Georgetown University. He was, and they switched to Proposition 48, and they would switch to SAT requirements. They kept increasing the ones, and no matter when you, whatever you do, we rise to it. Oh, it's like the NCAA now. They when I was last coaching, it was 14 core classes to be qualified with the NCAA clearinghouse, man, 16. So no matter what, we're going to continue to hit the mark because we're resilient people. But when you say chasing it, I'm never going to fault someone for chasing them dreams. You know, and, and one of the things, we can't get food in thinking that everything is a level playing field because it's not. Because those pockets are real deep at the FBS level. Those pockets are so deep, we'll never be able to touch those pockets. And trust me when I tell you, the, 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 the boosters, and the, the constituents, they put their money where their mouth is. So if I'm a young 17, 18-year-old trying to make it, and I got this school telling me this, and this other school saying, I'm not only telling you this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making sure you get everything that I'm telling you you're going to get. Yeah, they're going to go over there. Well, you know, I'm you laughing. Know? I'm laughing because we have, you know, the pay-to-play that just passed. Hello, they've been doing that all along. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being in the business, I won't, I won't, I won't speak on that. But you understand what I'm saying. You know, in my opinion, of course. You know, and 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 now um, I've had a chance. You know, you know, I'll just say I I agree with you. I just say that. And, and so, know who you are. Know who you are. You you're not a player in that game. I don't see. It's probably if you look at the hundred. 503 HBCUs that play football, and I don't know this to be the case, but I would say today, for this early signing period, I bet you it's not more than 10 that 10 people signed with HBCU. Mm. They're going to wait. They're going to wait until February. You know, because man, all the big boys that got out the way, the kids that got their little hearts broken, so now the recruiting can get, can really begin for the lower tier schools. Right. That's the, the you know the the non power five FBS as well as the FCS schools and, 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 and you know and, and that's actually better to me because now <laughs> what we used to always say we would get kids that's a three four star and they would say they wanted to come but they only wanted to come on the visit to hang out uh-huh. they didn't really they wasn't going to consider the school but you had to bring the kid. So I would always say, okay, yeah, we know this kid ain't gonna sign with us, but you, you know, we, we you know, we're necessarily showing him a good time. You just talk to him about, you know, for maybe in two years, he may call you. You know, you want to treat him, say, hey, look here, you know, you know, you want to just make sure he has your number in his roller deck, so in his phone for when you when show that age to your you staff, not coach. Him. They don't use know, roller decks no more. <laughs> yeah, you, you need a smartphone or something, a tablet yeah. or something, coach. <laughs> I know. Sometimes I go old and I get young. So, But, but it, it, it is a, the recruiting thing is it's something serious. You, you know, you have to stay on top of it. And there's so many angles to it. But, you know, you have to understand HBCUs, understand who we are, and, and how to go about doing it. Because when you keep hiring coaches that don't have HBCU experience, and they go in there trying to recruiting stuff like they've done it at those white schools. It ain't going to work. <laughs> it, it, it just ain't going to work. There's a certain way you have to recruit at HBCUs. There right. is. Now, I'm not going well, to I'm I'm not gonna have you reveal any more secrets, but let, let, let me ask this. Uh, in rec- when it comes to recruiting, we know it's a 24-hour thing now, especially with the technology that we have available. Would it be safe to assume that you could be pretty accurate on recruiting a player without physically being there to see or touch that player? I mean, you could, but I wouldn't trust it. Uh-huh. Because just like on the flip side, with the technology and all that stuff, she is lie. Mm-hmm. You, know, they'll, you know, they'll send someone else's tape in. And if, you, if you're a lazy recruiter and you don't bring that kid in or at least send a coach to his house or 
you know, you mess around and find a kid that ain't, ain't who they say they are. Mm. I've seen it firsthand. You know, I've seen it with a kid and someone else taped it. I'm like, wow, this kid can play, whatever, man. What if we just took the tape at face value and signed the kid? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, then, then when we got, damn, you look a little taller on tape. <laughs> he, he, you know, uh, yeah, and we was like, wow, he got it. He tried to get us. Well, you me, have to do your homework. And, and and part of doing your homework, and and this, this is not a trade secret, but it's just, I guess, a moral practice standard. How often, if at all, do you do background checks on your future uh, student athletes that you're recruiting? I, I don't. I don't think, you know, I think you may do something on transfers, but I don't think out of high school, because, you know, once kids sign national letters of intent, you know, there's so much wording in those letters of intent. So basically, say, hey, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I haven't done those things. You know, you don't really do a background. You may do a Google check or something like that, but not a police background. And then even with JUCOs, you better do some background check. I'm going to remember our first year at Prairie View, we had a kid, he was too good to be true coming from a JUCO, man. He was so good. And we did, I just kept saying, man, this kid should not fall to us. Mm. This is, a, you know, he's a Pac-12 kid. He's coming from out of California. He came on a visit, and, man, we just, something was in, something just ain't rubbed me the right way. And I just, we just kept, I just said, look, man, let's keep being. I said, because this kid is too good. And come to find out, he had already been at a four-year school. Wow. And uh, then he went to a two-year school, and then he was trying to come back and play at another four-year school. I mean, he ended up playing like three years at a four-year school. Wow. Three or four years, and he went to a JUCO for another year. And then, he, then we saw the tape. We're like, wow. We bought him on a visit. I'm like, man, this kid, he was two-season. I mean, he was real good. <laughs> but let's say we ain't do our work, and we just signed him. We'd have got in trouble. Yeah, that would have been that would have been some dark days on the hill, brother. Some dark. But you know days. what he said what when I said? asked him? I was, he said, "Damn, you caught me, coach." All right, man. He left. Never heard from him again. <laughs> well, it's, it goes to show dot the eyes and cross the T's. Coach Henry <laughs> Frazier, man, it is always a blast and a joy to catch up with you. And uh, we got to make sure that we uh, touch bases yet again. And as a custom here on the show, we want to give you some final thoughts and comments as we get ready to come to a conclusion on this segment, sir. But I sure appreciate you having me. It was good to go down memory lane a little bit. You know, I love my time down at Prairie View. Man, Prairie View was such a special time for me. You know, and I often say to my kids who grew up in Texas, I, you know, I, you know, I wish I had never left, but, you know, you know, circumstances, you know, had me had to get out of there. And, um, you know, so it's a special place. And I've always said it, and, and it always have a special place in my heart. You know, the, the, the order, the alums, and everybody associated with Prairie View. And, and I, it is no secret, I always have a desire to return. And I, and I think I shared with you a long a time ago, Mike, if I ever get back to Prairie View, in any capacity, they don't have to drag me out of there. You know, <laughs> Coach Frazier done died in his office. So, you know, so, you know, and, and that could be in anything, you know, in whatever capacity. I just think it's a marvelous place. You know, I, I just love the way they go about business and developing young people for the future. And everybody that I've met loved that school. They went there. They love it. I look at, the, you know, when the freshman class, out the freshman class, they just love the school and they do an awesome job. Of, of developing young people and and then me graduating from there and then graduating from Bowie State. I looked up, I think a year ago, and they had the top two HBCU money earners for graduates was Prairie View and Bowie State. And I was like, man, I need some of that money, you know. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, it's always good to catch up. And then, you know, with the FCS football and HBC football, I think it's, it's on the rise. And one thing we didn't touch on it, I, you know, we probably should have jumped in was Sam U. Because Sam, you, you know, had they not did those self-imposed, they would have been representing the uh, MEAC in, in the celebration bowl. And Willie Simmons has done an awesome job down there, Sam, you, as well as uh, my old father, Jay, KJ Black, is down there coaching. So you know, that's something that we could talk about at a later date. Oh, yes, that, sir. As a matter of fact, that's going yeah. to be on the to-do list once the celebration bowl is complete. Yeah, yes. But I appreciate talking football, talking shop, and I'm looking forward to that celebration bowl. And, you know, if I had to make a prediction, old swag people, I would have to probably say A&T 
A and T twenty seven, all core twenty three. 27-23. I got you on lock, Coach. I got you on lock. <laughs> coach Henry Frazier, I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. want to thank you guys so much for joining in with us. Don't forget our social media handles for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are at The Mike Prince Show. The YouTube channel is Open Mic Broadcast Network and our 24-hour dial-in message line, 713-570-6736. And until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.